Hello YouTube, this is Richard from Original Outdoors. I am in a forest somewhere in the north of the UK. So this is a video I shot a few weeks ago. It's not necessarily the most exciting or sexy of subjects, but to be honest, it's a really important one. When you go out to buy a new rucksack, boots, a knife, an ax, mountain bike, kayak, whatever it is, you get to go and use it fairly quickly. Next time you go out and do whatever your hobby or activity is, you get to use a first aid kit, hopefully you never have to use it. It just stays in your bag and takes up room. It's just sat there like an insurance policy you never have to claim on. I wanted to make a video about how I put my medical kits together, mainly for the UK environment. Hopefully there's some stuff in there that works wherever you are in the world, and particularly a planning methodology for it. I'm now gonna do that thing where I put my hand over the lens and I'll be magically transported to North Wales where I'll be wearing, I think I got the same hat on, but a different jacket. So let's see if that works. Bye. So what do you put in a medical kit? Well, it depends where you're going, what you're going to be doing when you get there and how you're getting there. Because each one of those things will dictate what you carry, how much of it you carry, and just how you carry it. Because what you'd pack for a five week sailing trip would be completely different to what you'd carry for two or three days winter mountaineering and wild camping up in Scotland. Some of the things will be common. Some of the things will be specific to that trip. Your How much weight you can carry and how much room you have in your bag or storage or whatever is also going to help dictate that. With all of those variables, how do you work out just what you're going to carry and how to carry it? Well, you can just go and buy first aid kits off the shelf. There are some fantastic medical kits out there. We're going to have a look at one in a moment but I always like to modify them or adapt them to what I need based on my experience and what's in that kit changes over time. I'll take something out because I realize, you know what, I've never used this and I can improvise something else if I need to. And there'll be other times where I've dealt with an incident or come across an injury or just heard a story where I thought, you know what, I've got no way to deal with that. What I carried when I was in Mountain Rescue and on a call out was issued by the team. It was a very specific set of equipment and medication and drugs and a few other things that were there to so I could do my job but also pool it with the other resources within the team or the party to be able to treat that casualty better. Working as a remote area medic and working on events and challenges and support for sort of remote area events that was either dictated by the company or I was left to come up with my own kit based on my experience. And what I carry on my personal trips and what I carry when I'm leading groups in the outdoors today is built up from all of that experience. So the list I'm gonna go through in a moment and that kit is based on my experiences. Your experiences are gonna be different. The environments you're working in are gonna be different. The jobs you're doing are going to be different, but it doesn't matter. The actual items in the kit are variable. Some can come in, some can come out. The way you put it together and that structured methodology is the important bit. So that's what I really want you to focus on in this video is not the items themselves, but it's my decision-making process as to why they're in there. So without waffling on anymore, let's go and have a look at the kit. So in front of me here, I have three medical kits. This one, which is an off the shelf, more or less, Life Systems Mountain First Aid Kit. This is what you'll see uh, being used by my freelance staff when we have uh, events and we've got big groups going out into the outdoors. So this is 95% off the shelf and it's all pretty much what you'd expect. There's dressings and bandages in the middle, so glow stick, some tape, ibuprofen, paracetamol. I've added some blister plasters and a foil blanket and uh, a few other useful things to the kit, but pretty much off the shelf and they're excellent kits. This one, which is my chainsaw and working with big cutting power tools in the middle of nowhere pouch, which this is mostly about major bleeds. This has got a combat application tourniquet and some cellox dressings and a few other things in there. That's a very specific use and hopefully this is something that I will only ever have to keep to hand and never have to use. Now this is my personal medical kit. So this is for UK wilderness trips. So by UK wilderness, I mean places like the quiet bits of Snowdonia or the Scottish Highlands or parts of the Peak District, Mid Wales, even parts of the Lake District, where even though you're only a couple of thousand feet above sea level 
and you're not hundreds of miles from the nearest point of rescue, you are still in a place where you can't just call for an ambulance and expect it to be there within eight minutes. Even if you were to call for mountain rescue, you'd still be looking at three or four hours, depending on the conditions, where you are, and even the availability of the team and search and rescue helicopters and things like that. So I've got stuff in here that's based around that scenario. Doing stuff on my own or in small groups in the remote outdoor places in the UK. So the thing with most first aid kits is that you're only really preparing for two ends of that first aid medical care spectrum. At one end, you've got the really minor niggling stuff that is, are things that are annoying that if you've got a few small bits of kit with you or an item that you can deal with that problem and then just reset and carry on. So that can be things like headaches, small cuts, diarrhea, bowel issues, that kind of thing, dirty water, stuff that if you have a small plaster or some an aspirin or ibuprofen or strapping tape, things like water purification tablets, Imodium, all of those things, you can deal with that short-term minor problem and stop it becoming a major problem. So at the other end of the spectrum, we have the big serious stuff. So most often for a first aid environment, that's trauma. So that's open wounds, bleeding, breaks, head injuries, spinal injuries, that kind of thing. So there at that end you've got you've got stuff that is only ever going to be used once it's only it's going to be used once quickly and in a hurry and you need to have the right items there the stuff in the middle you don't tend to have to deal with because you don't if you have a chronic problem or a problem that's going to last a few weeks that you might have to deal with day in day out you don't go on the trip it's, unless it's something that develops during that trip which in which case it'll probably start at this end and be a minor problem then you don't really have to deal with it so most first aid kits are built to deal with minor everyday stuff that you just need to deal with and carry on or big bad stuff that you need to be able to deal with correctly and straight away with the right equipment with that in mind the first thing that you need from a medical kit is yourself it's your brain training is the most important thing you can do if you haven't had any first aid training there's no point going any further with this video or at least you don't really need to start worrying about lots of expensive bits of equipment or working out whether this is the best tourniquet or that tourniquet go on a first aid course there are lots of different ways of accessing first aid training. You can do it fairly inexpensively through charities like St. John's Ambulance, the Red Cross, St. Andrews, or whatever medical charities might exist in your country. There are different programs you can get into, or even if you know somebody who can give you some training or teach you the basics from, their, from a point of expertise, then it's worth doing. Almost every medical incident I've ever had to deal with, whether it's something involving myself or a family member or a neighbour or a friend, or it's been something as part of my previous role in mountain rescue and search and rescue, or with a client or somebody that I've come across whilst in the outdoors and I've given help to that way, or just some person on the street. Almost every single one of those incidents has started with me applying knowledge me applying things that I knew. It didn't start with grabbing the first aid kit and just throwing it at them and diving in and expecting everything to work. It started with things like a correct primary survey, being able to assess danger, being able to assess response, being able to assess and open and protect an airway, being able to assess and correctly maintain breathing, being able to assess circulation and pulse and spotting major bleeds and being able to deal with them. All of those things can be done with your eyes, your brain, your hands and not much else. The really important stuff that you can do to save somebody's life doesn't start with equipment, it starts with training and I can't emphasise that enough. You've got some training, you've got some medical experience and you know that you want to carry a first aid kit because you should because if you're going out on your own, 
you really need it. If you're going out with other people, chances are you quite like those people. So you'll want to be able to do something to <laughs> prevent any further injury to them or to make sure that if anything does happen, you're able to deal with it or at least give them the best chance of surviving or leading a full life thereafter. There's always an element of risk when doing any kind of outdoor sport, hobby, pastime or work because just by being out in the cold, in the wind, in the rain and being exposed, you're opening yourself up to things like hypothermia. You, are, you might be dealing with cutting tools or sharp edges, unprotected edges, stones, rocks, tree branches. You can fall off things. There are more things to fall off in the mountains than there are at home. There are more things to hit yourself in the face with if you're kayaking or running through forests or running around with guns or anything like that. There's a lot more ways to injure yourself in the outdoors, but it's also a great place to be. So that's why we're here. My criteria for a first aid kit is that it shouldn't weigh any more than it has to. It should be there to supplement knowledge and training. It should be easily accessed and shouldn't be damaged or easily damaged by being thrown into a rucksack or the back of a vehicle. Uh, rain shouldn't be a problem. If my pack goes into a river and I have to fish it out and then deal with a medical incident, that kit shouldn't be ruined or made less useful by being soaked like that. So in this off the shelf Mole admin pouch, I've got very similar items to what I might find in this Life Systems Mountain First Aid Kit. I'm not looking for something tactical or tactical. It's just these Cordura Mole pouches are quite hard wearing. They've got lots of straps and places to attach things to. They've got Velcro on them so you can easily attach identifying pouches and they just seem to survive things. So I'm gonna now shift the camera to an overhead view and I'm gonna lay everything from this pouch out on the box in front of me so you can see what's in there. So there we have all of the items laid out. Now this kit weighs just under a kilogram, which is a little bit on the heavy side. If I was going fast and light and I was only expecting to deal with minor stuff and I just have to live with the other problems, or maybe not live, then I would go for something smaller. But this covers most things that I'm likely to expect for most land-based activities in the UK. So, starting off with the important things, we've got PPE and personal protection. When you're going through a primary survey and approaching a casualty on the floor, you go through DRABC, Dr. ABC. So, danger, response, airway, breathing, circulation. And with danger, the first thing you're looking at is hazards to yourself because the order of priority is you, then your team, and then the casualty. There's no point putting yourself at great risk to assist the casualty if you're then just going to become another casualty and someone else is going to have to come and get you and it just carries on. So you've got to look after yourself from the start. In terms of equipment, what I've got here for that are some nitrile gloves. Now these are in bundled up in pairs like that. So these are sized to fit my fairly large hands. They're for my protection. They're not to protect the casualty. They're for my protection from bodily fluids and other potential risks to myself. So I've got gloves there, fairly thick and tough. They don't have to be sealed in plastic bags because if something has happened to that person and they've got an open wound, then chances are the thing that stabbed them or cut them open is dirtier than the gloves that are gonna be in your bag. So don't worry too much about them being out like that. Just make sure that they are bundled up in pairs, ready to go. I've got this, this is a resource aid. So effectively, this is, get out of the bag. See, that's already a fail there. But if this was with a casualty, I'd just tear that open. This is a 
fairly robust vinyl sheet with a little valve mouth guard there. And what this does is go over a casualty's mouth when you're performing CPR on them. So the idea of it is that you don't actually have to contact the patient or their mouth. Um, it's not a kissing problem. It's to do with things like vomit. Uh, because if you're pumping on somebody's chest and they've had a heart attack and there's a good chance that vomit or bodily fluids of some kind are involved. So that's there again to protect you. And to finish off that protection bit, we've also got a good supply of proper alcohol gel. So alcohol gel or antibacterial hand sanitizer, as it says here, doesn't actually remove any dirt, it just makes it clean. So this should help clean up and at least reduce the chances of passing infection from one place to another. When you're dealing with even a relatively minor wound in an outdoor environment, part of the problem is that everything gets dirty, everything gets blood on it, um, which I'll come onto that more in a moment, but being able to make yourself cleaner very, very quickly is always useful. I've also got a selection of non-alcohol hygienic cleansing wipes. These all say alcohol free on them. Uh, they're just like moist wipes, um, but they are antibacterial and will clean an area. And then you can get these things as well. We, this is a Clinel wipe, um, but there are other brand names available, but this is just a very, very thick and very large, about that kind of size, about the size of this box version of that. So this is there for major cleanup work, um, either cleaning an area before you put a plaster on it, a Band-Aid, if you're over on the wrong side of the Atlantic. Uh, but if you want to clean up a big area, then these are great. If you, <laughs> if you want to uh, use it as a cleaning aid for yourself and give yourself sort of a, a good stand-up festival shower, then they work quite well as well. But I'm not going to go diving into the first aid kit for that. It's worth mentioning that if you're looking at things with alcohol in them, uh, you need to bear in mind where you're going and do a bit of research on the countries you're traveling or flying into, particularly if you're backpacking. Uh, there are cultural and, and religious and legal restrictions on carrying alcohol into certain countries, particularly through airports. So I do know of some people who have lost their entire medical kit because of alcohol hand gel. So do be aware. Talking about cleaning and sterilization, I've got these. So I've got two different kinds of Normasol, uh, sterile topical irrigation solution, uh, the different brand names, but basically it's sterile water. I've got these two which are in sachets, they're like sort of ketchup sachets, and I've got these two here in little squeezy pods. They look like those drinks you used to get when you were a kid. You just squirt them into your mouth and just give yourself a hit of sugar and e-numbers. So I've got two different types here. What These are really good for just taking the corner off and pouring into a wound or to clean up an area. Um, whereas these here, because they've got a very narrow nozzle and you can just cut the top off, they're really good for getting a bit of pressure behind them and squirting into somebody's eye to remove foreign objects and that kind of thing. You don't want to be poking into someone's eye with a piece of gauze or a bandage if you can avoid it. If you can do it with sterile water, then fantastic. Also great if somebody has got a contact lens problem. So moving on to open wounds, bleeding, that kind of thing. I've got this Ziploc bag full of various plasters and dressings, again, band-aids if you're on the wrong side of the Atlantic. Uh, you can get different types, different sizes. So I've got a wide selection in here. I've also got this type, which is kind of, it's fabric adhesive dressing strip, but just think of it as a three foot long, very narrow band-aid plaster so the dressing part is in the middle there and it's just a very long thin strip that's great for making up dressings for hands and fingers or toes or awkward places where one of these dressings wouldn't necessarily fit i've also got these things which are steri strips so they are reinforced wound closure strips they're very sticky and they're very strong along the axis there are three here there's one two three what you do with these is clean out a wound and then hold the edges of the wound together with the area around it clean and dry and strip them over the top. Put a dressing on the top and it acts like a suture, it acts like a stitch 
uh, for a short period of time. They don't work that well on areas that are really uh, being flexed a lot back and forth, but on small cuts or slices that you want to keep closed whilst you get yourself to safety or back to civilization or medical care, it, they do a good job. I've also got a few things like this, which are blister patches. There are lots of different products on the market for dealing with blisters. I really like this type, uh, which you can put on when you start to feel the blister start to become hot before it's actually started to turn into a blister, or where you've had a blister and it's burst and now you've got a flap of skin and an open raw area, these can act like a second skin and go on top of that. They're all there in there together. So if I'm looking through this medical kit in the dark with a head torch trying to deal with a small problem, then at least I know that all the plaster sticking stuff to your body things are in there. In another Ziploc pouch, I've got lots of different low, low adherent dressings. So these go from things that big up to things that big. So these are for covering grazes or open wounds or large areas. There's a couple of very absorbent ones in there as well, which are great for folding up or packing into wounds or major bleeds. I've also got the triangular bandage. This is the thing that you always see with somebody with their arm in a sling. Um, to be honest, I, in all the broken wrists and elbows and forearms and things that I've seen or dealt with, I've never used one of these for that. I've used them as head dressings. I've used them to wrap around other things, but if somebody's wearing a coat or they've got a long sleeve and you need to put their arm up there to relieve the weight on their shoulder or to relieve the weight on that break and prevent further pain, then just strap that bit to there. You can, I've even <laughs> seen people tape the arm to the shoulder. Uh, there are often better ways of doing it, but it doesn't take up much room and it doesn't weigh very much, so it goes in. I've also got these things. So I've got various dressings and bandages. So these three here are small wound dressings. Well, a small wound and two medium wound dressings. So these have an absorbent pad with a long strip of bandage attached to them. The idea is that you put the pad on and then you have a short tail of bandage and then you wrap the long tail around and then tie the short tail to whatever's left of the long tail or tuck it away um, and you can then also put this stuff which is crepe bandage um, and use that to put pressure on the area or strap it together or just keep the wound dressing on. I've not put too many of these in because they take up a lot of room. If you're dealing with a bleed that is going through that dressing and that dressing and all the absorbent pads there then either you're not putting enough pressure on it or no matter how much stuff you've got with you unless you can get evacuation in less than an hour or so it's not going to make much of a difference if you look at combat situations and places where people have had major trauma unexpe unexpectedly and people have been on hand with tourniquets and cellox dressings and had everything there ready to go and I'm sure many of you watching this have either sadly seen this firsthand or you know somebody who has experienced it, then you also know that in those situations, it's not just one or two dressings, you need everything. And the most important thing is the call to the helicopter or the evacuation or you picking them up and running to somewhere where they can get more help. If you're on your own in the middle of the Cairngorms, then you aren't going to be able to carry much to sort yourself out and then last for four or five hours. So you need to be able to deal with that problem before it arises by taking more care, choosing your route, choosing what you're doing and using your equipment carefully. Or you just need to accept it as part of the risk. Your opinion might vary. That's fine. This video is about what I've chosen to do with my kit. I've got tape. I've got various types of tape, some zinc oxide, some strapping tape, some low friction plastic tape and some duct tape. They're all in there. They all do their own job. They either keep dressings on or can be used to strap things or even just use to repair equipment. So I've got various bits of tape there all in a separate bag so I can just grab the tape bag. I've got this, which is a small mirror. And you wonder why I've got a mirror in there. Well, it's, I mean, Apart from having to apply my makeup every morning and make sure my beard is neatly trimmed, it's also bloody useful if you're on your own and you have an injury to the face or you have an object in your eye 
or you need to be able to look at yourself to be able to deal with an injury or even look at somewhere awkward to see what's happening down there. If you're trying to remove ticks or something like that, it's something you need to look at. So this is actually a piece of polished aluminium um, on a little strap and it goes in a little pouch there and it doesn't take up much weight. You can modify something you, you have yourself. You can get a small makeup mirror. I tend to go for things that can't break, so no glass. So that's why I've gone for a metal aluminium one. But if you can find something, it's well worth doing. I've got medication. So I've got a whole Ziploc pouch here, which is a different kind of plastic and a different closure to the other pouches in here. That's intentional because I want to be able to put my hand in there in the dark and feel which one this is. So in here, I've got a variety of things. I've got things like water purification tablets. I've got diorolite powder. I've got Imodium. I've got these burn shield gels that you can use to uh, help prevent minor burns from becoming more infected. I've got hydrocortisone cream. I've got ibuprofen, paracetamol, and a few other things. I'm not gonna go through everything that's in here um, because it's down to you. If you require med regular medication, then, you, then it's something you obviously need to have with you. Um, but what if you have angina? Then you need to have your GTN spray in there. But it being buried in the first aid kit isn't much good to you. You need that in the top pouch of your rucksack or somewhere that's easily accessible. The same goes for an inhaler if you're an asthmatic. If the stuff that you will suddenly need, there's no point it's being buried in a first aid kit like this. You can go down that road too far and have things scattered all over your rucksack, but if it's a medication that you require straight away and seconds matter, then consider putting that elsewhere in your bag that's easy to find, okay? Also, something that fits in with the drug side of things is this, which is a SIS, blackcurrant flavor, sugary energy gel type thing. So this is not for my own personal consumption unless I absolutely need it, but it's more, it's a, it's a easily stored, easily used and carried source of glucose. So that might be useful to somebody who's hypoglycemic, somebody who's diabetic. Uh, it's very, very rare that in an outdoor active environment, you'll actually get somebody who goes hyperglycemic and has too much sugar in their bloodstream. Uh, it's more likely that it's going to go the other way and be hypoglycemic. Obviously, if you are diabetic and you need to carry insulin, then you're going to be able to manage that much more on your own. But again, it doesn't weigh very much. It doesn't take up much room. So this goes in the first aid kit. And in fact, glucose gel is listed in the Mountain Rescue England and Wales drugs list as, one of, as a medication for carry and use on the hill. So it goes in there in that category. I've got some sharp things. So I've got a couple of things in here. I've got a small disposable scalpel in a hard plastic case. I've got a pair of tough cut shears and I've got a small pair of blunt scissors. So each one of those cutting tools does a different job. Scalpel, obviously it's scalpel sharp, uh, very useful for cutting away small flaps of skin or making a point where I need to have a sharp end to go into something. Tough cut shears like this are there for cutting through clothing and going straight up through. So if I need to access somebody who's got a major bleed in their leg and I need to be able to put pressure on it and see what I'm doing, I'm not going to ask them if it's okay if I cut through their trousers. I'm just going to do it. And if they're upset with me for cutting through their trousers, but I've saved their life, then we can deal with that afterwards. I'll buy them a new pair, a small pair of scissors, because again, scissors are useful. You can just use your knife, but there are some things that actually a pair of scissors are much better for, particularly very small fine cuts or trimming dressings so they fit well on the gaps between fingers or something like that. Scissors don't seem important until you need them and you haven't got them. In here I have got tweezers and they go into the same category as the scissors really. Until you need them you don't realize how much <laughs> how useful they are. They're great for removing splinters, foreign objects, that kind of thing. The needles, the needle end of a syringe. So these are in hard plastic cases, they're sterile, they are safe to carry in there and they're easy to be put away again without leaving a sharp thing loose in the bag. They're, they aren't there for injections, they're in my kit for lancing blisters or for areas where I need to make a small fine hole um, that can also leak the fluid out. So it's mostly blisters. Um, 
if you're going to need to pop a blister and actually open it out, then you need to be able to deal with it hygienically and be able to prevent further infection and deal with it properly. So there's a lot of things here for that, but if you can reduce the size of that hole to a pinprick, literally, then you're gonna have a better time of it. I've got this thing, which is actually a little reusable thermometer. So it's a color change strip. It's just that little thing in here and then a reference thing on here. So you can take somebody's temperature uh, and you can reuse this. It's not a single use, but once it's been in somebody, then you'll probably only want to use it on that person. Safety pins, they can be used to repair things, hold dressings together, yada, yada, yada. I've got this, which is a tick card um, because it's removing ticks or removing ticks properly is really quite important and it can become a medical issue so it goes in the first aid kit and I quite like these you have a large opening and a small opening for whether it's a an empty tick or a full tick and a little magnifying glass there so you can see what you're dealing with and make sure that you remove the head properly again it doesn't weigh very much or take up much room so why not put it in there And a few of the weird things that fall into that, it doesn't take up much weight, why not put it in their category, are these. And these aren't really medical items, they push it more into the realms of survival. But hell, if you can grab one thing from your kit bag and carry it with you, your first aid kit's a pretty good choice. So I've got some lifeboat emergency matches here. I've got a bit of wax tinder card. I have one of these things, which a lot of people don't like but it weighs less than a fire steel and it's useful enough and i have this which is a one liter water carrying bag with a little strap so i can carry water and then sterilize it with the sterilization tabs in the medical in the medication bag and i can do quite a lot with very little kit there so actually out of my rucksack and out of my travel kit, this acts as a mini survival kit in its own right. Because I have cordage with a tape, I've got plastic bags to hold water in, I've got things to clean things with, I've got medication, I've got sharp tools and cutting tools, I've got a lot of things here that in a survival situation where it's the classic sort of downed aircraft, lost your kit, that kind of thing, if I've managed to keep hold of my first aid kit, I'm doing quite well. I've also got just a spare Ziploc bag because I can put anything, all of the things that I use, so whether it's dirty gloves that have blood on them, used wipes, dressings, that kind of thing, can go in there and be sealed shut. I can clean the outside of the bag with another alcohol wipe or cleansing wipe, and then I've got something in there that I can carry out with me, but it's obvious what it is in my rucksack, so no one's going to go into it. Foil, mylar, survival blanket thing, these the sort of thing that gets thrown at you when you finish a marathon or something like that. They're okay, they actually work better as a liner for a shelter or a reflective shield or something like that rather than a piece of clothing, but it's in there and it doesn't take up much room. That's the kit. Uh, there isn't really anything else there. I've got one of these little night on stick glow in the dark things that just keeps glowing. So if I do put my kit down in the dark, I've got a chance of finding it and a small carabiner and that's about it. There are a few other things I might have scattered around my rucksack that will be useful in a medical situation. Things like a group shelter, an emergency shelter or a bag, uh, a knife, a head torch. You also need to make sure that all of the items in here are in date and that they are well maintained and that the drugs and the medication are all in date, that the dressings are still safe to use. Most of these dressings do have expiration dates on them but for personal use, if you're not doing it in a professional fashion, they should be fine to use. Um, you want to make sure that everything still works properly and functions properly. And you need to go through these medical kits at least once a year. And to be honest, it's not a bad idea to familiarize yourself with what's in there regularly, because I know from my own experiences that most first aid kits will go in the bottom of a bag and only come out every time you empty the leaves out of the bottom of the bag and they just get thrown back in again so being familiar with what's in your first aid kit and where it is is always going to be helpful to you as i said at the top of the video what you're carrying is going to depend on where you're going what you're going to be doing when you get there what other people in your party are going to be doing and so on 
So there are a few things that you might want to add to this kit or have somewhere else in your bag. We already talked about medication and having important seconds are precious medication somewhere where it's easy to access them. Um, and the same goes for things like this, which are, well, this is the modular bandage and the moderate hemorrhage uh, sort of side of the Cellox dressings, but there are other hemo stop dressings available on the market. Things that are designed to stop major bleeds and if something goes really wrong, there is blood pumping out of somebody, then these are the kind of things you're grabbing. There are also these things available, which are combat application tourniquets. These are very, very useful. Uh, anybody who works with firearms uh, regularly is probably familiar with these. This is, yeah, tactical medical solutions. So this is a genuine one. There are lots of cheap fakes online, so it's worth spending the money. I think if you need to spend at least 25, 30 pounds on one of these to get a good one. Um, but there are some substandard ones that look good, but don't actually do the job because that needs to be a very solid metal bar. That needs to be a metal clip there. And the whole thing needs to be able to have a lot of force put through it. If you've got substandard webbing, substandard uh, stitching. I've even heard horror stories about this bar just snapping in half because it's very cheap impure metal. It just doesn't bear thinking about. If this is the thing that's going to save your life or save your friend's life and because you were a bit cheap and you didn't want to spend that, mu that much money on it then have you possibly killed them or yourself? You can improvise tourniquets from other items, just paracord, a belt, and just pressure on the wound as well. There are lots of things we can go into around tourniquets and pressure for wounds. But this, the combat application tourniquet does that job very well. So if you're going to places where you're likely to end up with a large hole in yourself or somebody else, it's worth thinking about carrying, as well as a dedicated blast or cellox or open wound bandage. So they're items worth thinking worth thinking about carrying but i wouldn't necessarily have them in my major first aid kit i would have them somewhere in the top of my pack or i don't know in a pocket or a pouch on my person somewhere they wouldn't be buried underneath everything else you may also be familiar with these things so this is a sam splint this is the 36 inch one and it's the civilian one because it's orange and blue you can splint using lots of different objects you can use a roll of fabric to make a neck splint or a neck brace to prevent neck movement in the case of spinal or suspected spinal injury you can use a branch or a walking pole or the shaft of an axe or a saw or anything to splint a leg or an arm but these things these sort of a double foam strip with a layer of metal in between that fold very very easily into quite complicated shapes again it's one of those things it doesn't weigh very much it's worth carrying and that is already well in fact if i do it that way suitable for splinting a really awkward place like an elbow or into a forearm you can make a cervical collar or another collar with one of these you can cut them into strips they will actually i've cut down with a pair of tough cuts i have cut them to shape with tough cuts um, they tend to be not quite disposable but once you've used it on somebody you're unlikely to be able to use it properly or rely on it again and they, so it's worth carrying but assuming that if you're going to be using it and really bending it into shape more than i did there then you probably want to look at getting another one again it's something that might be dependent on where you're going and I don't tend to carry one for day-to-day -day stuff, but if I'm going mountain biking, there's one of those in my bag. Um, just because the risk of a broken bone or difficult to splint injury there is much higher than it would be if I'm walking through a forest for two or three days. So there we have a kit. I'm going to post the content list of this kit on the website, and there's a link below the video. So the main takeaways from this video are that training is the most important thing clearing somebody's airway, stopping a major bleed, putting them into the recovery position without compromising their spinal integrity and being aware of things like spinal injury. It, all, none of that requires equipment. It can all be done with your hands and with knowledge. 
So they are really important things and training is the first thing you should go to. Not the Gucci kit, training. The second thing is consider the type of injuries and likelihood of injury you're gonna have. So is it gonna be the small minor stuff that you might have to deal with and then just carry on? Because a blister or several blisters or quite bad diarrhea or anything, or losing your main water purification methods can all stop a trip there in the tracks and you have to go back to the car, back to back home, back to civilization, whatever it is. And have you got the stuff to deal with the major things at one end? but being realistic about how much you can actually do. If somebody drops in front of you and they're unconscious and they can't detect a pulse and you start, you're going into starting CPR, then that's all training based. But if it's a major bleed, then you need the dressings. You need the things to absorb that blood and help promote clotting to stop it bleeding any further. If it's going to be a major, major incident where you can't deal with, with it unless you have a full military medics blast pack with cellox dressings and clotting agents and tourniquets and everything else, then you really need to look at your safety protocols for climbing or kayaking or bushcraft or whatever you're doing. If you are going to places where, or doing things where you are likely to end up with bullet holes in you and GSWs and legs cut cut off and that kind of thing then you're you need to start from a different point and you need to have a very dedicated medical kit for those kind of injuries and the third thing is that none of the things here are really that expensive most of the things can be picked up very inexpensively and if you're backed up by good training then you know how to improvise and how to use other items in your rucksack to be an effective first aider to be an effective carer for yourself or somebody else in a medical emergency. So three things, training, being realistic about what you're going to have to deal with and careful selection of equipment without just going down the, oh, that's expensive and shiny. Let's go and buy that online. It's not about who's got the coolest looking medical kit. It's who's got the medical kit that actually works and works in the way you need it to. Thank you for watching this video. If you like what we're doing with the channel and what we're trying to do in terms of the content we're sharing or our style of presentation, or you have any comments about that, put them in the comments below. We like feedback. If you have got any questions or you've got your own opinions or you want to suggest things that other people might be useful, put them in the comments below. If you think I'm a complete idiot and everything I say is wrong, then you're entitled to that as well. So you don't have to click like, you don't have to subscribe, but if you do like what we do and you do did enjoy this video, click those buttons and help support the channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.